And then uh, I can talk about it. Father, we thank you for the privilege that is ours. We're grateful that you have allowed us to be here on today. Thankful, Father, for the uh, privilege and the opportunity to study your word. And we pray, Lord, as we have come to uh, study your word and how to study your word, that you will help us. Lord, we ask that you would bless us and bless our time together. May it be fruitful, may it be productive, may it be filled with um, growth spiritually. May it be significant, and may we become a church that is biblically literate, biblically mature, growing and being conformed into the Lord, to the image of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, we ask your hand of blessing to rest on us. God, we give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Uh, so there's a small handout coming around. I have a larger handout that is going to be coming to you. It looks going to look like this. Um, when I when I when I bound it, you know, uh, one, I was kind of, you know, it was it was a, I was trying to edit what I had already taught through before, and it just turned into uh, a task that was a lot larger than what I thought. So by the time I got it complete, I was not able. Uh, to have bound copies for everyone, and so I will not uh, give out what I have um, to some of you. I'll wait till everybody er everybody has a chance to get it. So hopefully next, well, no excuses. There, it should be ready by next Wednesday. So everybody will get something that looks like this. What 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 you have uh, on tonight uh, is something that's going to pop up periodically. Now we're going to. Uh, we're, we're diving into a study on how to study the Word of God. And so um, periodically through this study, and there's about, there's, there's probably about 11 units to this lesson, I mean to this teaching. I'll tell you right from the very beginning, this is not a Sunday school class. Um, this is, this is going to be a time where we're going to be stretched. Uh, and so... Uh, I look forward to it, and I pray that you are looking forward to it as well. Um, I, I say not a Sunday school class. I don't mean to speak pejoratively of, uh, pejoratively of Sunday school classes. They, uh, you know, they, they have their purpose, and I think a lot of us have grown through Sunday school classes, especially with the kind of teaching that we, that we get here. This is going to be a more advanced sort of situation. So you're going to hear some terms that uh, perhaps you've never heard of. And uh, I'm going to be explaining those terms. And then you're going to need to come... Uh, with a ready mind to ask questions. Uh, you won't get, you, you will not get what you need to get out of this Bible study method course if you just show up and you listen and, um, and things you don't understand, you don't ask questions about. So you have to come with your questions. Uh, periodically throughout this lesson, throughout the, the, the lesson, once you all get the bound copies, uh, things like this are going to show up. There's going to be a lot of handouts outside, a lot of handouts outside the, uh, the bound copy that you're going to receive. So you'll be receiving things like this periodically. And these are just uh, exercises in the discipline of how to study the Word of God. And so uh, what I'm going to try to do is take some of the most misquoted verses in the Bible and apply um, you're going to see this. I'm going to introduce this on tonight, but I'm going to, uh, you're, you're going to apply some study methods to these texts that have been misquoted. Uh, perhaps you thought you were from, perhaps you thought you knew what they meant and maybe you'll find out that that's not what they meant at all, uh, by utilizing these study methods. And these study methods I'm going to introduce you to are going to be applicable to any text. So by the time you get to the end of, uh, this Bible study methods course, uh, you are going to have some tools that are going to help you uh, be a better Bible interpreter. So that's my goal. My goal is to make you a better Bible interpreter. I want sharp, sharp students of God's Word by the time we finish. So you got to come with your questions. You got to come sharp, uh, ready to ask, ready to learn, ready to discuss something you don't understand. You're gonna have to. You got to talk. You got to talk to me. All right. It's the way you're gonna get the most out of this is if you talk back to me. All right. So uh, tonight we're going to be looking at one of the most uh, misquoted verses in uh, one of the most misquoted verses that, I, that I've heard uh, in the Bible. And this is just one of many that we're going to look at on tonight. And I want you to turn with me to Malachi chapter three. Malachi chapter three. Oh, 
Old Testament book, Malachi chapter 3. It is, I believe, the last book in the uh, last book in the Old Testament. Last book in the English um, English version of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter three, and I'm going to begin reading at verse number eight. And we're going to just spend time uh, here just unpacking this. You're going to do some, some work for uh, me tonight and some work for yourselves as well. Malachi chapter 3, beginning in verse number 8. This is a familiar passage of Scripture. This is what the Word of God says. It says, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you in tithes and what do you have there? Oh, tithes and offerings. You robbed me in tithes and offerings. Notice what verse number 9 says. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Verse number 11 says, Then I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. Verse number 12, All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a, so you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. All right. Explain that to me. Te you, you teach me what, what that verse is teaching. Come on now, I know y'all, it, no, I know it's not, I know y'all heard it before, right? Okay, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this question. When do you normally hear this verse? Oh, offering time. Okay. Oh, so we really we usually hear Malachi 3 verses 10 at offering time. Um why? Why do we hear Malachi chapter 3 verses 10 at offering time? Because it has tithes and offerings in it, okay? What is the uh, demand of this particular text? Bring. Yeah, you got to bring this. And uh, what is tithes and offerings? So what is, what is a... What are tithes and offerings? What's that? It's money? Okay. Okay. So it wasn't, you said, so, so monetary value. Okay. Did they have money back in this day? Don't, let, let's, let's, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Somebody else tell me something, t tell me something else about Malachi 3, 3 verses 10. 10, okay. So this is a 10. How do you know that? How do you know that a tithe is a 10? A tenth of what we have? Okay. Okay. Bring your first tenth to him. Okay. A tithe? 
You tell me. Okay, all right. Anybody else? Ah, yeah. So, so this is the whole purpose of, I'm sorry to cut you off, brother. What did you say? Okay. Anybody else want to add to this? We oftentimes hear this verse. Um, okay, so, let, so we oftentimes hear this verse at offering time, right? Uh, as, and in, you know, as it's read, people intend this to be an encouragement for people to give their money, right? Uh, so what happens if they don't give their money? You're robbing God? Yeah, you're robbing God, but if you don't bring your money according to this verse, not, not, not just that you won't get the blessings, but you're what? You're cursed. If you don't bring God your money, you are cursed. Yes? I'm just laying groundwork. I haven't said anything yet. I just, yeah, I got you. I got you. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm fielding all the questions. I'm taking them all in. Yes. Tired is mentioned in the New Testament. Yep, we'll get to it in just a second. Yeah, so, uh, mm, so you don't give a tenth of your money, and not only are you robbing God, but you are cursed. You are cursed. So let, let me ask you this. Um, how do you reconcile that as a student of the Bible with what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3 when it says that Christ became a curse for us? If I don't give my, my money, I'm, I'm cursed, and yet at the same time, Christ lifted the curse. Well, how, how, can the two, how, how can the two things be true? I haven't said anything yet. I, I'm definitely not saying that. I'm just saying, we're just, we're just, these are things that we've heard our entire life. Yes, I got uh, Sister Littles. Yes, it does matter. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it does matter. Good. Yeah, does context matters. Yes, sir. It's tied to the law. Tithing is tied to the law. Okay, we're under grace. If we're under grace, how can we, so that, this is your response to how can we be cursed? If we're under grace, am I am I correct? Do I am I understanding you correctly? Okay. Yes, brother. What's from the grace that we live out? Okay. But are we under the law? Okay. Yeah, I mean, out of obedience, out of out of love to Jesus, we obey the law. Okay. Uh, is that am, am I correct? Am I understanding you correct? Okay. Yes, bro. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I mean, I would tend to think so. As I'm just reading, as I'm just reading, as I'm plowing through my Bible on a regular basis, and I hear somebody around offering time read Malachi chapter 3, 
verses 10, and they tell me to bring the tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and that I might prove God, and if I don't do it, then I'm cursed. I'm thinking about how can I, and this is just in my own mind, I'm just thinking, if Christ became a curse, how can I still be cursed? How can the two things be true? You see what I'm saying? Either Christ lifted the curse or he did not. So I, I need to understand what this, I need to understand what this text is teaching, right? And what I want to show you is that there are a number of texts that we have uh, heard and perhaps have assumed that we knew the meaning of them, but we've never asked questions of the text. This, this course is for you to be able to receive uh, what is necessary for you to become a better Bible reader, a better listener, and a better interpreter of God's Word. And so, uh, right at the very beginning, you see on your handout that we have about, you're going to see this when you get your full uh, bound copies of How to Study the Bible, but I'm going to give you tonight, I'm going to go ahead and, and introduce them to you tonight. But there are five, I, I just call these like, these are five, if a, if a diamond has uh, four characteristics that gives to it, that gives to us, um, you know, that tells us whether or not a diamond is a real diamond. Uh, the four C's of diamond uh, clarity. There are five C's of biblical clarity that I want to give you, you know, on tonight in order to help you become a better student of God's word. And so these five principles, much like Devout Christianity was really an expansion of Acts chapter 2, verses 42. When we went through Devout Christianity, you kept hearing Acts 2.42 come up. In every, almost every lesson, Acts 2.42 came up, even though we were dealing with uh, different texts. These five C's that I'm about to give you on tonight is going to function a lot like Acts chapter 2, verses 42 did in Devout Christianity. We're going to be applying these five we're going to be applying these five C's of biblical clarity to every single text that we look at in every single genre. And you're going to understand what that means by the time you get done with this lesson. So the first is going to be context. The, the very first C of biblical clarity is, is context. Context as... Uh, context as... Um, I have encountered it as this. My, my Bible study methods professor would say, I'm saying Bible study methods right now, but there's going to be a 50 cent word I'm going to give you later. My Bible study methods professor would say, context is the mother of interpretation. All right? Context is the mother of interpretation. What does he mean? He means that context is going to give birth to correct interpretations that you cannot understand any text of Scripture by taking it out of its context and giving it a meaning that it never had. Uh, I could say it this way, and you need to write this down. Scripture can never mean what it never meant. The scripture can never mean what it never meant. I can't say that this verse means this when it never meant that. All right? So context is the mother of interpretation. Context is going to give us, context is really going to give birth. So when a sister is asking about Israel, how does Israel play a part in Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 12? Uh, it, 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 Israel is significant in a text like this because Israel is a part of the overarching context. So as, as God is giving this scathing rebuke, he's giving it to a particular people, all right, for a reason. The context is going to help me understand that. The second, uh, the second aspect of biblical clarity is going to be cross-reference. And we're going to, everything that I'm telling you tonight, we're going to apply to this text, so just hang in there. Con uh, cross-reference. You cannot be a good student of the Bible. You cannot be, you can't be, a good interpreter of Scripture if you are not utilizing cross-references. Now, what do I mean by cross-references? I mean that when I see tithe in the Bible, I, I can bet you that this is not the only place that tithing shows up in the Bible. I guarantee you there, there are a number of texts that are going to deal with tithing. And as I begin to look at the composite picture of what tithing is throughout the Bible, it's going to tell me exactly what tithing is. All right? 
You, are you with me? So, so I'm not, I, I can't look at, I, I can't import a meaning in the tithing that Malachi did not mean, and most importantly, that God did not mean when he spoke of tithing. So you got to use cross-references. I can put it this way, uh, and you can write this down. The Bible is its best own interpreter. Scripture interprets Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. So I don't have to make up an interpretation of the text. I can allow Scripture to comment on Scripture to give me the meaning of what a text means. All right? But you can't do this without cross-reference. So at first I'm asking, I'm asking about context. Who was this written to? What was the audience? Who was the writer? Uh, what was the occupation of the writer? Who was the audience that the writer was writing to? What was going on in this particular text? I'm asking all these questions, and I'm answering all these questions as I'm studying the Word of God in order to arrive at the correct interpretation of a text. Then after I answer as many questions as I can with regards to context, I'm going to answer questions by utilizing cross-references. When I, when I say cross-references, you need to have, if you don't have a good study Bible, you at least need to have, you at least need to have a Bible that is pointing you to some sort of margin in your Bible. And um, so in my Bible, it's this little column in the middle. And if I'm looking at, so for instance, I, I have Malachi chapter 3, verses 10 open right now. And as I look at Malachi chapter 3, verses 10, right before bring, it has a letter A. This letter A is, is pointing me, this letter A, is pointing me to the middle of the margin of my Bible, this area right here. So I find verse 10 in the margin of my Bible. I look for the letter A, and right beside the letter A, there's going to be another verse. So what, what uh, Bible scholars, exegetes, you're going to find out what that means. Exegetes are interpreters of Scripture. What, what they have done for me and given me a Bible with cross-references is they have pointed me to other references that help explain what's going on in verse number 10. And here's, the, here's, here's, what's, here's what's interesting. When, and th we're going to look at this text in just a few minutes. In Malachi chapter 3, verses 10, the letter A that comes right before bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, it's pointing me to three key texts on tithing. Three texts on tithing. And all three of them, when I looked at this, all three texts that this letter is pointing me to are all essential to helping me understand exactly what a tithe is, how did people tithe, what did they give when they tithe. All, all three references here, all right? So that's, that's the importance of a cross-reference. Now, if you have a study Bible that has study notes with it, then that's going to give you more information. Um... Which brings us to the third C of biblical clarity, which is going to be to consult. So we have context, we have, cro we have cross reference, we have consult. And when I say consult, I mean consult with godly scholarship. What I mean, with God what I mean by godly scholarship, I mean like if you have, a, I mean, if you have a good study Bible, if you have an uh, English Standard Version, ESV Study Bible, Charles Ryrie Study Bible, uh, MacArthur Study Bible, there's a Reformation Study Bible that's out that just came out recently. All of these Bibles are, are going to be recommended sources. Uh, I will recommend these sources to you because they are compiled by individuals that have trustworthy lives and trustworthy theology. And so after I look at context, after I look at cross-reference, I might have a study Bible, and in this study Bible, whether this is ESV or Charles Ryrie or MacArthur or Reformation Study Bible, I might, look at the, the, I might look at down at the margin, and it's going to give me some commentary on this text. So I've, I've consulted godly scholarship, trustworthy individuals, to help me understand, again, I'm, I'm, keep this in front of you, we're trying to figure out what did Malachi mean when he recorded what he recorded in Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. It's already been, you know, it's, we've already gone on record that perhaps what we have assumed that it meant 
it doesn't mean. And you don't want to be wrong on God's word. Because the reality is you can't be sanctified by error. You can't be sanctified by error. Imagine, imagine telling a widow in the church that desires to give but doesn't have it to give that because you did not give today, you're cursed. And she goes home with that. But it would be one thing if that was true. But, uh, but imagine telling that lie. Are you listening to me? You listening to me? Okay. So uh, consult with godly scholarship. And, I, you know, you consult with godly scholarship because um, truth is not new. There's typically no new truth. All truth is old truth. And all truth, which is God's truth, is going to come with a cloud of witnesses that are saying the same thing. They're all saying the same things. In fact, if you are out on an island by yourself when it comes to Bible interpretation, you probably are by yourself. And if you are by yourself, that's not a good place to be. If you have 2,000 years of church history, if you have 2,000 years of history and beyond, back into Moses, that is telling you that what you have thought about this verse is not correct, you have all these witnesses saying it's not correct, and you say, well, I'm going, I, I don't see it like Moses saw it. Well, I don't see it like the church father saw it. Well, I don't see it like the Bible scholar. I see it this way. Being on an island by yourself against all of the witnesses, you're probably wrong. You're probably wrong. Um, fourthly, the fourth C is to uh, conclude. What do I mean when I say conclude? Take a wild guess. Come to a decision, good. You come to a decision. Now think, look how many steps you've gone through in order to come to a decision. You've looked at context, you made notes on context, you looked at cross-references, wherever your Bible pointed you, you've looked at those texts. And you need to look at those texts and make sure that they are on, in this particular instance, they are tithing texts. Because the, the uh, um, sometimes they're cross-references and you might look at it and say, well, I don't really see how how that, those texts are making a marriage in this Bible. And they might not be, you know. Um, but if they are, you want to take notes on that. Understand that. Understand, the, the, uh, understand um, what's going on in the cross-references. And then I want to check. It's almost like a math problem. I want to check my work. I want to check my work. I've done this and I've done this and now I want to check my work and I want to check my work by credible sources. Now, I didn't say this, but in, in the consultation of godly scholarship, you can go beyond the study Bible and you can get uh, what is known as uh, commentaries. So there are men and women who have given their entire lives and their t entire careers to, study, to studying one book. I remember when I was preaching through 1 Peter, there was a, a sister by the name of Karen Job. Karen Job was an exegetical scholar in 1 Peter, and when I tell you that by far, she was probably the best exegete that I worked with when I was preaching through 1 Peter. I make no, I'm not making up any story. She was phenomenal, phenomenal on 1 Peter. She gave her life to 1 Peter. She, she gave her life to understanding 1 Peter translating Greek, all that, studying the languages, she, she did all of that. And it is a rich resource for the church. So I'm saying this, you can go beyond a study Bible. You go beyond a study Bible, you can get commentaries that are going to go deeper than what your study Bible is going in order to consult with godly scholarship. Um, after this, after I, I see what this text is teaching, I, I see what the text is teaching, um, now I'm going to conclude now I'm going to conclude. Once I get to the end, I'm going to conclude. I'm going to, make a, I'm going to come to a conclusion, a decision, on what tithing is in Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. And then once I make that, and then once I conclude, the last step, the last step is going to be to comply. 
So uh, here, here I'm making a decision. I'm making a decision internally. I'm concluding. I'm making a decision internally. And here, complying, I'm making a decision externally. All right? So I make up my mind on this text. Having done all these steps, I make up my mind. And after I make up my mind on this text, then I'm going to comply. Given that it's correct, I'm going to comply with the truth that I have gleaned from this particular text. So these five C's are going to govern and guide us as we begin our study uh, in Bible study methods. So let's just begin to, uh, let's begin to apply some of this to Malachi chapter 3, uh, verses, verses 8 through 12. And let's see if we can apply these to this text and then arrive at the correct meaning. So we see uh, tithes. Bring the tithe into the storehouse. Now let's say I don't, let, let's say, I don't know, let's just assume for a second that I don't know what a tithe is. I've never been to church before. I've never heard a pastor even teach about tithing. I don't know what a tithe is. So I hear this for the first time. The first time I hear the word tithe, what is going to be the question that I ask? What is a tithe? And that's how you really have to come to your Bible. You have to come as a blank slate. What is a, what is a tithe? What is a tithe? I've never heard that word before. What is a tithe? So I might write out a question. What is it? What is a tithe? What is the offering? What does the author mean by tithes and offerings in Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10? I could ask, what is a storehouse? And I might write out to the side of this, bring the tithes into the storehouse. What is a storehouse? And then he says, so that there may be food in his house, and that he'll open up the windows of heaven, and that he will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground in verse number 11. So I have all these questions. These are all things that if, uh, if let's, say I'm just a, let's say I'm a brand new believer, or say this is just something I haven't, I've just never heard this before. All these things are new to me, you know. Malachi may be new to a lot of us on tonight. Uh, never really did an in-depth study on Malachi. Maybe we have heard of this verse but didn't know where this verse was even found. So now we see this verse and now we need to understand what it is. So let's see. We have uh, context, right? Malachi writes this. Maybe I don't know a lot about Malachi. I see in the context that Malachi is saying that people have robbed God. And how do they rob them? Well, they, they rob them in tithes and offerings. I don't know what that means. I, I, you know, I'm not familiar with that. I see the seriousness of robbing God of tithes and offerings because in verse 9 he says you are cursed with a curse. So I'm thinking, well, what does that mean to be cursed with a curse? And then I run into this cross-reference in verse 10. So let's look at these cross-references uh, just for a second. The first cross-reference that we get, and I'm going to just give you this right at the outset. I'm going to give you this right at the very beginning of this, of this, uh, of this lesson. Well, not in, we're in the middle of it now, but um, maybe you did not know this. But the tithe is a tenth, yes, but Israel was commanded to give three-tenths. So, so the tithe, the, the tithe was not 10%. In certain years, the tithe was 30%. So let's, 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 uh, let's unpack this. Leviticus is the first tithe. Leviticus, and this, is, it gives me, this cross-reference is right, uh, this gives me this cross-reference right in the margin. Leviticus chapter 27 is the first cross-reference that we have, and I'm going to just uh, inform you that this is the first tithe that is mentioned. Leviticus chapter 27, verses 30. Come with me to Leviticus chapter 27, verses 30. And again, remember, all I'm doing is I'm taking these methods and I'm applying them to a text. Leviticus chapter 27, verses 30 through 33. Leviticus chapter 27, uh, verses 30 through 33. Leviticus chapter 27, verses 30 through, uh, 27, verses 30 through 33. And notice what the uh, Word of God says here. It says, um, Thus all the tithe of the what? The tithe of the land. Now that's interesting. 
that it's the tide of the land. What does that mean? Money grows on trees. Yes? Anybody agree with that? What, I mean, what does it mean? It has to mean money, right? I've always heard that it meant money. But it says tithe of the land. So what does that mean? What is that? Probably, probably crops, right? Yes? Uh, well, what, I, it, what the question I would ask there is, is, is tithe mentioned in that text? Okay. See, see, and this, that's good. I'm happy that you brought that up. Because a lot of times that's what we tend to do, all of us, me included. We tend to think of other places instead of, in order to, in order to arrive at the correct interpretation of the text, I have to deal with texts that are dealing with the subject that I'm studying. Okay? So, so if I say, Cain and Abel, I might jump to that text, but I might not see tithing in that text, so that text might not be helpful in helping me to arrive at the correct interpretation of Malachi chapter 3, verses 8. Okay? People do that all the time. The whole 2 p.m. Bible study uh, was, the whole 2 p.m. Bible study today uh, just turned into uh, a lot of different questions. <laughs> I'll just say that. And we spent time just chasing, you know, we, we spent time just, you know, chasing things around, around Scripture. But it's because our minds tend to jump certain places before we actually arrive at the correct interpretation of one text. So I don't want to go to Cain and Abel yet. I just want to deal with tithing texts, okay? So here I see already that this tithe is a tithe that is of the land. And then I get further clarification here of the what? Of the seed of the land. Now let me pause and just say, um, what this text is teaching you is that you need to sow a seed. You sow a seed. Sow a seed and you will reap. Yes? Look, look how divided y'all are. Some of you are saying yes, and some of y'all are saying no. Well, which one is it? Yes or no? You know, it don't even say nothing about sowing a seed, does it? That's how you get God. That's how you get God. No, it's just telling you what a tithe is. Thus, all the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If, there a, if, if, if therefore a man wishes to redeem part of his tithe, he shall add to it one-fifth of it for every tenth part of herd. So a tithe is also, yes, yeah, herd, flock. Whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. He is not to be concerned whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. Or if he does exchange it, then both it and its substitute shall become holy. It shall not be redeemed. Now there's a cross-reference to Leviticus 27 verses 30 through 33 that helps us to understand what is known as the Levitical tithe, and that's what this is. So the first tithe that we have in Scripture is what is known as the Levitical tithe, and this is a tithe that is given to the Levites. So let's, let's look at this. Numbers chapter 18 is a cross-reference. Numbers chapter 18 is a, is a cross-reference to Leviticus 27. Numbers chapter 18, and notice that all of this contextually is in the Mosaic Law. So I, I've given you two texts. One is in Leviticus, and now we're going to Numbers. And both Leviticus and Numbers is in what is known as Torah, which, are, which is within the first five books of the law. So this is a, this is a legal thing. All right? Context. All right, Numbers chapter 18, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers chapter 18. Numbers chapter 18. Notice um, here, Numbers chapter 18. Let's begin in verse number 21 of Numbers chapter 18. It says, To the sons of Levi, behold, I have given all the, what? Yeah, tithe of Israel for an inheritance in return for their service, which they perform, the service of the tent of meeting. The sons of Israel shall not come near the tent of meeting again, or they will bear sin and die. Only the Levites shall perform the service of the tent of meeting, and they will bear their iniquity. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations, and among the sons of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. So the Levitical tithe is given to the Levites because they, don't, they are the only tribe that does not have an inheritance. 
God is the inheritance of the Levites, all right? They are the priest. They, they, are the minis- they, they are the ministers. And they don't have an inheritance. God is their portion. So God is, so, so, so Moses is saying, listen, God is going to take care of them through the giving of this tenth, all right? This Levitical tenth. Uh, watch this. For the tithe of the sons of Israel, which they offer as an offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites for an inheritance. Therefore, I have said concerning them, they shall have no inheritance among the sons of Israel. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Moreover, you shall speak to the Levites and say to them, When you take from the sons of Israel the tithe, which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then you shall present an offering from it to the Lord, a tithe of the tithe. So here's what we have going on. The people give this Levitical tithe to the Levites, and the Levites receive this Levitical tithe, and they are to give a tithe off the tithe that was given to them by the people. All right? Are you with me? Is this clear? Yes? No? Maybe so? Okay. Verse 27, your offering shall be reckoned to you as a, as the what? As the grain. Still de- we're still dealing with agricultural language. We haven't used money yet. You, do you see this? We're talking about tithe, and we haven't used money not one time. All right? Um, grain from the threshing floor or the full produce from the wine bag. So you shall also present an offering to the Lord from your tithes, which you receive from the sons of Israel, and from it you shall give the Lord's offering to Aaron the priest. So people give a tithe to the Levites in order to care for the Levites because the Levites don't have the, an inheritance like the rest of the tribes. God is taking care of the Levites. Once the Levites receive a tithe, from the people in order to care for their needs, then the Levites take that tithe and they give that tithe to Aaron. They give a tithe from their tithe to Aaron the priest in order to take care of him. Out of all your gifts, you shall present every offering due to the Lord from all the best of them, the sacred part of them. You shall say to them, when you have offered from it the best of it, then the rest shall be reckoned to the Levites as a product of the threshing floor and as the product of the wine vat, you may eat of it anywhere, you and your household, for it is your what? Oh, wow. What's the compensation? What's the compensation here? The tie, and what are they to do with the tie? Eat it. Eat it. Um... It's a compensation in return for your service in the tent of meeting. You will bear no sin by reason of it when you have offered the best of it, but you shall not profane the, sac- the, sac- the sacred gifts of the sons of Israel, or you will die. So, Leviticus 27, 30 through 33, along with this cross-reference, Numbers chapter 18, verses 21 through 32, what we have here is we have the Levitical tithe, and this tithe was given again by the people. This is agriculture, herds, flocks, given to the Levites. The Levites received this tenth from the people to care for their needs, and they take part of the tenth that was given to them, and they give it to Aaron, the priest, and the rest of it they eat. They eat it. All right? That's the first tithe. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 14, we have a second tithe that is mentioned. Now, remember I told you that there are three tenths, not one tenth, that Israel was supposed to give. Deuteronomy chapter 14, Deuteronomy chapter 14, Deuteronomy chapter 14, Let's begin in verse number 22. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22. This tithe is for a different reason, by the way. Deuteronomy chapter 14, uh, verses 22. Again, this is also in the Mosaic Law. It says, you shall surely what? Yeah, it says, you shall surely tithe. He's talking to Israel. Tithe all the what? All the produce, what is produce? 
It's what? Right, it's food. The same way the Levites was to eat their compensation. Here we see a second tithe, and the tithe that is mentioned here is also food. From what you sow, which comes out of the what? Field every year. You shall eat it in the presence of the Lord your God at the place where he chooses to establish his name. The tithe of your what? Grain, your new wine, your oil, and the firstborn of your what? Herd and your what? So that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. If, now, now, here, now, here, now here's the rub, because some people would say, and we heard this at the very beginning, some people would say, well, in that day, the produce and the grains and the herds and the flocks, it was equivalent to money. We have money today. They didn't have money back in that day, right? They didn't have money back in that day, so they didn't tithe money. They tithe their flocks. So th this text is going to disabuse us of that sort of thinking. Watch what it says. It says in verse 24, if the distance is so great for you that you are not able to bring the what? If you're not able to bring the tithe, since the place where the Lord your God chooses to set his name is what? Too far away from you when the Lord God blesses you, then you shall do what? Exchange it for what? Money. Ma, ma, ma. No, they had money, but the tithe was something different. And they couldn't carry flocks, and they couldn't carry goats, and they couldn't carry all these vats of wine in their arms to the place. If God set his name, if God set his name in Canaan down, Canaan Town, Kentucky, and I got to bring my tithe, and I got vats of wine to the place where God has set his name, and I got flocks, and I got herds, and all my boys, they got flocks, and they got herds. There's no way we can carry all of this on cattle to Canaan Town. So God says, let me make a provision for you in the law. Since the place where I'm going to set my name is too far, you sell the tithe for money. Sell it for money. And so what do we do when we get the money? Notice what God, notice what God says in his word. Then you shall exchange it for money and bind the money in your hand. Why? Because I can carry the money, but I can't carry the wine. I can carry the money, but I can't carry the, the cattle and the flocks. And go to the place which the Lord your God chooses. You may spend the money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink or whatever your heart desires, and there you shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice you and your household. Also, you shall not neglect the Levite. Here it is again. You shall not neglect the Levite who is in your town, for he has no portion or inheritance among you. Watch this. At the end of every third year, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in that year, and you shall deposit it in your town. The Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance among you, and the alien, the orphan, and the widow who are in your town, you shall come and eat and be satisfied in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. So the second tithe, the second tithe is also produce. It's herds, it's flocks, it's wine. And if the tithe that you had was too big and you couldn't take it to where God has said his name, you would sell the tithe for money. And then when you get to the place where God has said his name, you would buy the tithe back. <laughs> you would buy the tithe back and then you would eat it and rejoice. And you wouldn't forget about the Levite. You would make sure that he was squared away, too, because he doesn't have an inheritance. The Lord is his portion. All right. Are you with me? So this tithe, unlike the Levitical tithe, was for convocation. It was for worship. It was for celebration, for festal celebrations. So one-tenth, and now we have a second-tenth. There is a third-tenth, which is mentioned here in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 12. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 12. And this, this tithe, this third tithe is also mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 14, 
uh, verses 28 as well. But we'll look at this in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 12. Now notice this, Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 12, it says this, when you have finished paying all the tithe of your increase, in the third year, the year of tithing, then you shall give it to the Levite, to the stranger, to the orphan, to the widow, that they may, may eat in your towns and be satisfied. So you have three different tithes. These are three different tents that Israel was commanded by God to give. And the tithe was produce, it was agriculture, it was herds, it was flocks, it was wine. And in one, in one instance, it was a tenth was given to the Levites because they don't, again, they don't have an inheritance. So the nation of Israel would take care of the, of the ministers. The second tithe was given on the third and on the sixth year of what is known as a sabbatical year in Israel. In the seventh year, the land was to rest. So they were not to till the ground in the seventh year, the land was to rest. So built into Israel's calendar was a year of rest, just like built into our week is a day of rest where we give it to God. So they weren't supposed to till anything in the seventh year. They were supposed to let the land rest. But on the third and on the sixth year, they were to give a tithe that would care for, not just the priests, but would care for the orphans, that would care for the widows, that would care for those that were oppressed, that would care for those that were in need. That was on the third and on the sixth year. And then you have the tithe in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 22, which was used for festal celebrations. So these three tenths were given by Israel uh, the first, second year, the fourth, fifth year, they were to give not 10%, they were to give 20%. On the third and sixth year, they were to add to that 20% another 10%, which made the tithe around 30 to 33%. Well, if you have 100 cow, how many cows would you give? 10. Well, he just said whatever passes under the rod, you give it, you, you give of the best of that, right? In the, in the verse that we just read. Yeah, so you're, you're, giving, you're giving your tithe, a tithe is a tenth, and you're giving a tenth of your produce, you're giving a tenth of your flock, you're giving a tenth of whatever. I don't know. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So I, I guess they would round off to the nearest tenth. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just guessing, right? So I guess if I have, and I'm not being facetious, I'm just, if I have 95 cows and I'm required to give a 10, I'm probably going to give 10 cows. I'm, I give 10 and keep 85, you know? If I have 10, I'm gonna give one. If I have 20, I'm gonna give how many? Two, right? If I have two acres, or if I have 10 acres of grapes, We'll go back to Malachi in just a second. If I have 10 acres of grapes, how many acres am I going to give to God for that year? One acre. So I'm going to say, these nine acres of grapes over here are mine. Well, all of it really is the Lord's, right? Um, I'm going to give this, I'm going to give, I'm going to separate this part to the Lord and this part over here the Lord allows me to keep for myself, Right? So whatever I, have, whatever I have agriculturally or whatever I have in terms of livestock, God gets a tenth. So I don't, I don't have a prescription on what, I do, uh, on what I do if I have seven cows. I don't know. You know, I would say if I have seven, if you have seven dollars, uh, let's say this was money. Obviously, we see that it's not now. If I have seven dollars, I would say give one. It's not a ten. You know, actually, it's more than a ten. Or you can go to uh, McDonald's, buy a cup of coffee and get exact change, right? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, uh, the offering is was a part of the tithe. It was a heave offering. So a heave offering is mentioned. I don't have time to go to this, but you can write this down in Exodus chapter 29, verses 28. What Malachi is referencing in Malachi 3, verses 10 is a heave offering, which was a piece of herd and flock. So if I, if I have... I'm going to give a shoulder, of a breast, I believe it was a breast and a shoulder. It was a heave offering that was given to God in terms of tithes and offerings. So still in the offering, it was flock. It was still produce, even in the offering. Well, 
Yes. Yeah, it was wave offerings, heave offerings. I mean, there was a number of offerings, but even, even the offerings of Israel had to do with grain and agriculture. Yes. Hypothetical question. How'd you know? I could have been. You never know. Numbers, what, what is it? Numbers chapter 18, what is it? Numbers chapter 18, verses 32. You will bear no sin by reason of it when you have offered the best of it, but you shall not profane the sacred gifts of the sons of Israel or you will die. I mean, in the context, what is, so what is he asking them to do in the context? Let's just use this. I, I haven't, I've never preached this text, so I'm just going to use what I have. I have context, and in the context, what is he talking about? He's talking about presenting the best, right? He's talking about what? Tithing, giving. Well, how would I profane? How would I profane? Not doing what? Probably not giving it. Utilizing it for my own purposes neglecting, I see the Levite over here who has no portion, and I eat his portion. I profaned it. And I'm just using context, right? I'm just using what I know cross-reference-wise, okay? Now, uh, a minute. Malachi chapter 3. Let's go back to Malachi chapter 3 at the end of your Bible, and let's see if this holds true. We've seen tonight, uh, out of this text that is quoted all the time, and it's I'm saying it's the most quoted, one of the most quoted, mis misquoted texts in all of the Bible. And trust me, there are a number of them. This particular text, we've, we always say, okay, well, this is, I'm supposed to bring my money. If I don't bring my money, I'm cursed. And I'm supposed to bring a tenth of it. Well, they, they, well the tithe, biblically speaking, as far as Israel was concerned, was not a tenth. It was 20%. And in the third and sixth year, it was another 10%, which is 30%. The equivalent of that, by the way, is taxes that we have today. How much does Uncle Sam take out of your check? <laughs> yeah. Okay. When you, was, when you was paying taxes, how much did he take out? Six? Six percent? <laughs> Whoa, man, you, you owe him this year. I'm going to just tell you right there, right now. Uh, but before you even go to TurboTax and put that in, you, you owe him. Uh, how, how much? About 30 percent. About 30 to 35 percent. Yeah, a 33 and a third, yes. A 33 and a third. So think about this. A government taxation system was already built into ethnic Israel in the Old Testament. That's what the tithe was. And notice what the tithe did. It cared for the orphans. It cared for the widows. It cared for the, it cared for the ministers. It, it, was a, it was a welfare system for the nation of Israel. That's what the tithe was. Malachi chapter 3, let's see if this holds true. Will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me? But you say, how have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? You are cursed with a curse, you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house, and test me now in this, said the Lord, if, you, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven. You know where that phrase was used, cross-references again? You know where the windows of heaven was used uh, earlier in Scripture? Genesis, actually. In Genesis, when God floods the earth, he opens up the windows of heaven. And what comes out of the windows of heaven? No. When God flooded the earth, God flooded the earth with doves. Rain came out of the windows of heaven when God opened up the windows of heaven. Now, I need you to, make, I need you to connect the dots now. We're talking about produce. We're talking about crops. What makes crops grow? Rain. See if God says, listen, don't rob me of tithes, don't rob me of the agriculture, or else I'll shut up the windows of heaven and you won't have a crop. But don't rain, crops don't grow. 
You think you ain't got ties. Now, wait till I shut up the windows of heaven. Okay, you still don't believe me. Let's keep reading. Open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing until it does what? Until this blessing overflows. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you. And I've asked the question at the very beginning, what is a devourer? Windows of heaven pours out rain in order to fall on the land which will give me crops. What is a devourer? Pest. Yeah. God says, I will rebuke the devourer. The devourer is anything that will eat up the crops. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, listen, this was life-changing for me when I studied this. This is just this text in its context. I will rebuke the pest is what God is saying. So that, here's the reason why he's going to do it, so that it will not destroy the fruits of the what? Ground. Nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. This is, not a, this is not a text telling us that if you don't give 10% of your money, God is going to curse you with the curse that, by the way, Jesus lifted by way of his cross work. Either Christ took the curse or he didn't take the curse. I can't be cursed if Christ lifted the curse from off of my life. And nor is this saying, nor is this legalizing, nor is this making 10% legalistic to where, uh, you know, if I, if I don't give, I'm breaking God's commandment. Um, I don't have time to paint this. Jesus says in Matthew, so somebody asked, was tithing mentioned in the New Testament? It absolutely is. Write it down, Matthew chapter 23, verses 23. Jesus tells the Pharisees that you tithe. Listen to this. Jesus says to the Pharisees that you tithe in mint. What else? Anybody know? Mint and dill and cumin. What are those? Those are what? Crops. Yeah, spices. They're crops. And then he says, you neglect the weightier matters of the law. Matthew chapter 23, verses 23. Even Jesus knows that tithing is not money. It's not money. It's agriculture. Um, so what do we do? What is this? So, so, so we're not bound by law to give 10% to the, to, to the extent that if we don't give 10%, that God is going to condemn us to a burning hell. And nor should that be taught, because that's incorrect. And that's not the, that's not the correct interpretation of Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. So what is the correct? Uh, so what is it, what, what's correct for Christians to do? I don't have time to unpack this. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter, well, let me just go there and then we'll close. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I, yeah, I, I feel like I, I need to go here. 2 Corinthians chapter, yep. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Here is the commandment for the New Testament church. Here, here is the, and this is not even a law. This is just the freedom that comes in Christ. Here it is. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 says this. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will what? So there's a law. There's a law at work in giving and receiving. All right? If you don't give... You won't, you, won't re you won't receive. Now, this is, about, this is about giving of our resources. This is not a tithing text. This is a giving text. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has what? Purposed in his heart. Now, we took Malachi 3, verses 8, and it says you need to give 10, and that's a law. You need to give 10. The New Testament, the New Testament commandment is give what you have purposed in your heart. And here, here's the reality. Some people can give far above 10%. Are you listening to me? Are you, are you listening to me? This is what we call grace giving. Giving liberally. And we, we give we, we give graciously because we are recipients of the greatest gift that has ever been given. Are you listening to me? This is the law that is at work. And, and here's, here is, here's the reality. God doesn't need your money. God was doing just fine without your money before you was ever created. 
He don't need it. But there is a benefit and a blessing that comes to you when you take God up on this principle of sowing and reaping. So he says, listen, each one must do as he has purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. In other words, if you are mad when you have to give, if you're upset when you have to give, if you're not cheerful when you give, keep it. <laughs> keep it. In all, in all seriousness, keep it. If you're looking at it and you're, and you're worried, if you're looking and you're worried, don't do it. If you're sad, don't, don't give it. Because the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all what? Grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. So here's the reality. There are texts that are on giving, and there is a law that is at work in giving, and there's probably some things that we can take from uh, uh, harvesting crops. If I sow a lot of seed out in a field, then I'll get a lot of crops. The chances of me getting a lot of crops, is, as long as God opens up the windows of heaven and pours out rain, is good. That same principle exists within the context of the Christian church, that if I give, it comes back. And it's, it's a law. If I, if I give it, I'll always have it. But if, but if I try to keep it, I'll never, I'll never have it. I, I, I cannot keep what I do not, here's the law, I, I cannot keep what I do not give. That's the law. That's grace giving. Not under compulsion. Not this, not this 10% is going to break the bank. But I'm giving what I purposed in my heart. And for some people, that might not be as much as 10%, and there's other people that may be far more than 10% because I have it to give. And God promises to make sure that you always have if you give. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, allowing us to come together tonight. We thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Lord, we're grateful that uh, you have written a book that is not muddied if we just apply ourselves to study. Lord, you will help us. You will help us to come to the correct interpretation of the text. We're thankful, Father, that we are not under the law, but we are under grace. We're thankful, Father, that you have supplied us grace upon grace. You have freed us from the law, Christ having become a curse for us, Christ lifting the curse. Lord, help us to live in light of that grace that we have received. Help us to apply the truth of your word to our hearts. And God, be glorified in us as we do this. We trust you, O oh God. We trust you. We know that you know how to take care of us. And so, Lord, we bless you. We're thankful that we're not under the threat of punishment. We're thankful, Father, that you don't condemn us and that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that is freeing for us. It frees us to do more. It frees us to live better. It frees us to go further. It frees us to give more because you have freed us. And Lord, we, we love you, Lord. We pray that this truth will affect our hearts and this truth will affect our hands and this truth will affect our minds and our feet as well as we live this out. Father, we bless you. We thank you. We thank you tonight for all that you've done. We thank you for what you will continue to do. We give you the glory. Give traveling grace to your sheep as they head to their various destinations. Give us peaceful rest. And we, and we say thank you in advance for it. In Jesus' name, amen.